Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon with a phone that, a phone line you can access, although the lines are full right now, but it, uh, there will be lines opening up later. So if you have the number handy, you can call in. Uh, if you call in, we expect that you're calling because you have a, a question you want to ask or a disagreement with the host that you'd like to uh, register and talk about. So that's pretty much what we are, mainly a, a Q&A program. We've been on for 23 years. We're now on it, uh, or, or this coming month, we will be on uh, uh, about 40 stations nationwide. Still a pretty small network compared to most uh, nationwide programs, but it's slowly growing, and we've had, uh, uh, you know, we've survived. It's not very expensive to be on radio stations, but we've survived financially, and uh, that's been due to the grace of God. And we're glad. So we've had hundreds of, or I should say thousands of calls to this program over the years. I don't know everything and some things that um, that you might ask, I might not know the answer to. I won't, I won't pretend to know something I don't know. But because we've had so many thousands of calls over the last 23 years, there's a good chance that something you have a question about will be something that I've had occasion to look into and may be able to help out. The number to call will be 844 844- 484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. And I will announce this uh, because some of you know my dad. Uh, my da- This is a promotion day for my dad. He actually uh, went to heaven today, and I learned of it about 10 minutes ago. So uh, I did announce at the end of the program yesterday that my father had... Uh, a hematoma had been found in his uh, brain and that he had lost all his higher functions, though he was still breathing in a hospital room. And he was put, uh, oh, one last night, I guess, into a uh, hospice, ho- hospital hospice situation. And uh, we knew he'd we knew he'd go either today or tomorrow. Um, and I just got news that he went. But where he went is a, to a, a place that I desire to go. And I don't uh, I don't grieve over him going there. I, it'll be hard for, uh, for some of us. He left three kids, all Christians. Uh, and, and he was, uh, of course, a, a good Christian man. So we have no doubts about him, but, and my mom's a very strong Christian woman too. She's taken it well, but she, uh, but she will no doubt be extremely, uh, uh, you know, sad and, and have time adjusting because they were together as a very happy couple for about 70 one years and are 72 that they knew each other. So um, it's my, my mother's whole life has been uh, as a, a homemaker and a mother and a wife. And uh, especially since my dad's 95 and he had uh, a few health issues, uh, she's given him a lot of care. And now, of course, her her life is going to be redefined. I If, if you want to pray for anybody, uh, pray for my mom, for her to be able to adjust to this. Uh, she's, uh, sh- she'll be fine. We're all fine. So, uh, you don't need to, when you, when, when I want to answer your, your, uh, your phone here, when I put you on the air, you don't have to, you're not obliged to, uh, you know, uh, console us or anything like that. Uh, you can just go ahead and get to your question. Uh, just since I mentioned yesterday, the, the reason I mentioned it at the end of the program yesterday, rather than, um, early, is because I didn't want it to dominate the program. I wanted people to be able to, you know, participate in the program without feeling some obligatory uh, pressure to say, "Oh, we're so sorry for your dad." We're not sorry for him. Uh, we'll miss him and we'll be sorry for ourselves, but we're not sorry for him. He's a he's a happy man. He was a happy man in life, and he's an even happier man now that he's gone to where Paul said is much better. Um, and so it's his promotion. He, no more. No more facing the things that I'm afraid I have to face in the next few years living in this country. <clears throat> I, it's one reason I envy him. But we'll all, you know, all of us who are following Christ will be in that same place eventually. But there are hard times to come in all likelihood, and I'm very glad to have him spared them. Uh, <clears throat> enough on that for now. Let's talk to David from Las Vegas. David, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, Steve. Um, just... Uh... I had one comment and then um, kind of a a serious question after that. 
Uh-huh. I lost my mom on Christmas, and I, I'm very sorry for you. Um, so that's that. But my my comment was, and then I'll, I'll get to the question. My my comment was, is there are times where I'll be listening to the Word and um, really really getting in the Spirit, and, and I'll feel like um, I'm almost ready to just fully let go and, and go nine feet in into the Christian walk. And, and I feel like my insides are about to ex- explode out. And it's the only way I can explain it, but I can't stay in that place, you know? And, and sometimes the guilt of that gets to me because I'm like, well, am I, am I not fully surrendering or is, is this a common ebb and flow that kind of happens with, with Christians where you, where you just, you all the word comes alive and, and you feel like, you know, you feel like almost like one of the apostles, but you know, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to stay in that incredibly surrendered place for, for too long. And, uh, that's what I, well, I, I wouldn't equate, uh, the feelings that you're talking about. That is the, you know, the very positive feelings you're talking about. I wouldn't equate that with being in a very surrendered place. You might be in a very surrendered place, but you can be very surrendered whether you have any feelings about it or not. It's like you can be totally devoted to your wife or a woman to her husband, even when they don't have much feelings. You know, this is something people have lost sight of. We, we live in an age where so many things are evaluated by our emotions uh, when really there's better ways to evaluate them. Uh, many many marriages break up because a wife doesn't feel or a husband doesn't feel the same way uh, toward their spouse as they felt on their honeymoon. Uh, and yet, uh, to f- to feel the same way through your whole marriage as you felt on your honeymoon is not a very normal thing. Uh, it's it's uh, you know life is not all about feelings, and uh, it's it's more <clears throat> in the case of relationships about faithfulness, about being faithful to your spouse, being faithful to God, and to be totally devoted to God does not predict for any particular emotions. Now, I've had tremendous <clears throat> uh, gratifying emotions in my Christian life. I've had highs and, uh, and I've had uh, lows, but <clears throat> that's, that's speaking emotionally. In general, I've been uh, about, well, I've certainly been as devoted to the Lord all through. You know, the emotions come and go, but devotion to God doesn't, just like, just like in marriage, like I said. Uh, I hope that uh, I hope that most people who have been married for years and don't feel as they felt on their honeymoon uh, are not any less devoted to their spouse. And likewise, uh, sometimes when people first get saved, or, or maybe they just uh, reach a certain point in their life where they've got a newness in their relationship with God, that it, it feels like a honeymoon, and it's so exciting you hardly know how to express it. But then it's not that way all the time. And it's not supposed to be necessarily. I mean, there's nothing in the Bible that says it is supposed to be. If someone says, well, I just have felt like I'm on my honeymoon with Jesus for the past 70 years. Uh, well, wonderful. More power to you. But that's not most people's experience. I doubt if it was the apostles' experience. So, I mean, emotions are not what they valued most. Uh, even love, which is the most important thing in the Christian life, love for God or love for other people. Those are the two things that matter, Jesus said. Uh, love is not primarily emotion either. It certainly often is emotional. Uh, everyone, I hope, listening to me knows the emotion of loving God or loving somebody. But love in the Bible is more to do with faithfulness and, and dedication. And and it's what you do. For example, Jesus said that when he was asked by somebody how to love your neighbor as you love yourself, he gave the story of the what we call the Good Samaritan. And, uh, and at the end of it, he said, who, who was it in the story who loved his brother? And of course, it was the Samaritan. But we don't read uh, much about the Samaritan's uh, mode, uh, you know, emotions. We are told that he is moved with compassion toward the man who is in, da- in trouble. But his love for his neighbor was seen in his dedication to serving him and putting his neighbor's needs above his own and so forth. And that's why Jesus even paraphrased the old command, you shall love your neighbors, you love yourself, which comes from the Old Testament. He, he paraphrased it, do to others what you want done to them. It's what you do that shows that you love. It's not how you feel. And the same thing is true of God. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So whether you feel uh, a surge of uh, emotional love toward God at any given time or not, 
uh, should not have any impact whatsoever on whether you're faithful and obedient to him. Obedience to him uh, on a regular basis is the love of God. According to 1 John chapter 5, it says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. That is because we love him, we obey him and it's not a burden to do so, but it doesn't say anything about emotions there. Now, again, I've had plenty of wonderful emotions in my Christian life as a, you know, toward God and so forth, but I don't, uh, I, I don't worry. I don't worry if I'm not feeling such emotions at any given time. My, my relationship with God, uh, the gauge of its, uh, of its intimacy or of its uh, genuineness uh, does not, uh, is not the gauge of my emotions. And I don't think it should be for you either. But I'm not trying to discourage, I'm not trying to discourage those emotions. I think emotions are a wonderful thing. I'm, what I'm trying to discourage is that you would uh, let, let the emotional realm uh, determine in your mind you know, where you stand with God, because uh, that's not how we measure that. Well, I'm, care <clears throat> I'm careful about <clears throat> letting my emotions get away from me, because, I mean, I don't want to, you know, run on this emotion and be completely wrong. And take well, there's a danger of that, food. too. I mean, when, when emotions are given too much of a head and too much of a authority in our lives, Sometimes we almost uh, trust them too much. You know, we can't trust the absence of emotion to tell us that we're far from God because we may be very near to God and not have the emotions that we might want to associate with that. But we can't allow the presence of emotions to determine that, that we really are close to God because a person can be very far from God and have great emotions. I mean, every cultist can have the same emotions that, that a Christian has. Hindus and Buddhists can sometimes have emotions in their religion too. So, I mean, obviously having, that, that's the a mistake that Mormons often make. They, uh, their, their theology is not biblical, but they, they count on something they call uh, the, the testimony or the, the burning bosom, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> even, if they, even if they know that their uh, theology is shaky, they're sure they're right because uh, they they had this experience, this burning bosom, which is, if, it, if nothing else, an emotional experience. They don't realize that people in most religions once in a while have those emotions too. So yeah. having them, having emotions doesn't mean you're right with God. And not having them doesn't mean you're not right with God. So that's, that's about as yeah. far as we can go on this. But I, I understand your concern, uh, especially not to let your emotions carry you into a wrong area. You need to, however emotional you are in your or whatever great emotions may accompany your Bible reading, you need to make sure that you don't let them decide what you're going to believe and what you're going to uh, follow. You need to let your your solid, rational uh, decisions to be obedient to God <clears throat> be based on His Word and and uh, you know the wisdom that He gives. Anyway, I, I appreciate I appreciate your call, okay. brother. Thank you. I'm sorry. I, I had I was in the process of hitting the button to go to the next call. When I heard you say my name, I, I apologize that I cut you off uh, if you're going to say something more. Uh, Peter is from London, UK, is next. Hi, Peter. Welcome. Well, hi, Steve. I'm um, glad you're back with the Lord now. Um, uh, my question, so I've been listening to Bib your series on biblical counsel for change. And uh -huh. um, my, uh, so I, I'm, I don't know, I'm of, I don't, am I being too harsh when I'm of the opinion that you know, whether you have a mental, whether it's a mental health issue or, you know, an emotional, um, emotional hurt that, you know, Christ is enough. You don't need a therapist or a psychologist or some, or, me, or a medical examiner to then try and, um, you know, resolve the, the, you know, the issue that you have, whether it's mentally or emotionally. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if that's a normative, way to think because i have christian friends who say that oh you know, jesus is obviously enough but then he's given us all these medical um, practitioners to also help in that area and i don't know i'm of the opinion that i think if if yeah if you're having i don't think men, as you mentioned i don't think mental health is, is i think it's a spiritual issue um and yeah if you're finding that christ you know, just actually just going to him 
it's not enough, then I don't think that's an issue with Christ. I think it's, we're not. I'm not trying hard enough. I don't know. If I understand. That makes sense. I understand. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of people say, well, you can't just uh, hand out Bible verses like aspirin, or you can't just you know tell everyone that if they're in a crisis or traumatized that they just need to say a prayer. Uh, sometimes it's more complex than that. I, I agree. I, I don't think anyone should just be handing out Bible verses uh, like aspirins, although a Bible verse, if it's a well-chosen one, may contain the very truth that will set them free. And so that's a different issue. It's, we're, not, we're not saying that uh, knowing Bible verses is what, what is the cure, uh, but the truth of God, which we learn from the Bible and which we apply through the Holy Spirit, is the cure to a great number of the problems people have. Uh, likewise, when people say, well, you can't just say a prayer when someone's traumatized. Well, you can, but I would agree that just saying a prayer isn't a, a magic wand. Uh, praying is actually different than saying a prayer, in my opinion. I think that when we're praying, we're approaching God. I believe we're connecting with God. I believe we're making our requests known to God as children uh, approaching their father. That's That's praying. Saying a prayer can be done by people of every religion or even by an atheist when they're really in trouble. And saying a prayer isn't necessarily connecting with God. It can be, but it's not always so. Uh, you mentioned the series you're listening to. Some people may not know about it. It's a series of lectures. Like all the lectures at our website, it's free. Uh, and the series is called uh, Biblical Counsel for a Change. And it does contrast psychological and psychiatric uh, analyses of people's life problems with what the Bible actually teaches. And... Uh, so what you're saying is that your view is if people are having uh, psychological problems, Jesus is enough, but they may not be connecting with Jesus uh, in a normative way. Uh, and I, I think that that's true in most cases. Now, as I mentioned, there are such things as medical issues, and God has not promised to heal every medical issue supernaturally. Uh, your friend said, well, God has given us doctors. That is true. God has given us doctors for medical problems, but a medical problem is a physical problem uh, that has a medical remedy. Unfortunately, many spiritual problems have been misdiagnosed as medical issues. You know, they're not physical, they're spiritual. At least uh, every, every problem I've ever encountered that people have uh, come for counsel about are spiritual issues. Uh, now, there are people who have physical issues. There's no question about it. There's people who might have a a brain tumor or have a, a chemical imbalance, a thyroid problem, uh, you know, things like that, uh, hypoglycemia. These kinds of things often have an, uh, a profound effect on the brain, the physical brain. And the physical brain is an organ like the physical lung or the physical stomach or the physical heart or any other physical thing. And because it's physical, if it's damaged, it is sometimes possible to remedy that damage or treat it in with physical medicine okay so i'm not denying that there are people who have physiological problems that have an impact on their uh, brain and and mental activity there are but i don't believe that there are as many of them as the as the atheists say you see uh medical science a, a great number of people uh both in in the medical field and in the psychological and psychiatric field uh, do not have God in their thinking. A lot of them are atheists, but even if they're not atheists, they often are thinking in terms of training they've received from people who did not have God in their thinking either. You see, science today seems to feel they should proceed from the uh, naturalistic, materialistic worldview, which means that people can't have a problem that's spiritual because there is nothing spiritual. Everything's physical. And therefore, if, if everything's physical, then even the things that you and I would call spiritual they would have to explain in a physiological way because their worldview demands it. And when they do so, I think they often misdiagnose. For example, a thing like demon possession. We, we as Christians know, because the Bible informs us, that there is such a thing as demon possession. And people who have demons often are described as acting in ways that we might call psychotic or paranoid schizophrenic or in some other ways. Now, I'm not saying that everybody that is seems psychotic or schizophrenic has a demon. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that some people do. Some people have them. The Bible tells us that. And if a person has a demon, that's a spiritual problem. 
And a, me a medical doctor is not going to be able to help much with that unless he's an exorcist or a Christian. Uh, I mean, a Christian exorcist. Um, so, but, but even other spiritual problems, which aren't, you know, identified as demon possession, can be spiritual in nature. For example, unforgiving, a person who har harbors bitterness in their heart, or a person who has unresolved guilt. Those are not medical issues. Those are spiritual issues. Those are issues in their spiritual life. And the Bible addresses those and gives us the, the answer to them. Anxiety and depression, although uh, many people have been diagnosed drugs for those things, um, and, and maybe they ex re receive some uh, you know, relief from it, yet the Bible speaks of both of those things, depression, anxiety, uh, unforgiveness, hatred, uh, anger. These are spiritual issues, and the Bible uh, you know, instructs us in them. The thing is, it's a lot easier, a lot easier to go to a doctor and give a pill. And the, the people who say you can't just give out Bible verses as aspirin, uh, to them I'd say you can't just give out pharmaceutical drugs to solve spiritual problems. I mean, it's more complex than that. Humans are physical and spiritual beings, and some of their problems are physical. Those ones that are, I would recommend a, a medical doctor in many cases for them. Those that are not physical but are spiritual, I would recommend that Jesus is alone, what we need. And if we, if we say, but I'm a Christian, I still have these problems. That's not what I said. I didn't say being a Christian. I said, Jesus is the solution. There are many Christians who do not have a very close walk with Jesus, don't have as much faith as other people do, or don't have as much knowledge of what God has said and don't believe what he says much. There are Christians who don't connect with Jesus at a, at a level that is, frankly, available and possible to do. And I am... You know, someone asked me once, you know, where do you go when you need counseling? I've never gone anywhere for counseling. I mean, I, for counsel, you know, like life decisions, you know, I've, I've sought counsel. But counseling, therapy, I've never, I've never sought any therapy for anything. And I've been through some pretty traumatic things. I've had, two, I've had a wife who died. I've had two wives that abandoned me for other men. I, a pretty traumatic life in some cases. But I've never needed anything but God. He's, he's all there is for me. And, uh, and he's more than enough. Because those are not physical problems. If someone wanted to give me an antidepressant or something like that, I think, what, what in the world for? I don't need to be depressed. Uh, I've got joy unspeakable and full of glory. I've got a peace that passes understanding, things that doctors don't understand if they're not Christians. So this is my uh, position, Peter. I think that I agree with you that a great number of things that people say, oh, we should go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist and get, you know, get some meds for that or something, I think a lot of those things are being misdiagnosed by people who don't know enough about God or about the Bible uh, or don't believe in those things. Uh, and so they're, they're given a physiological uh, interpretation to behavior that is really spiritually rooted and can be healed through spiritual uh, adjustments and so forth uh, and obedience and or maybe even exorcism in some cases. Those things are all true, but there's also, it's also true that there are people who have actual physiological issues, some chemical issues, some, you know, uh, other kinds of physical injuries and so forth that that make them act erratically. Um, so I would say that the answer has got to be nuanced. We've got to be able to determine when a problem is physiological and when it's spiritual. Because if we try to apply uh, spiritual remedies to physiological problems, they won't always, they won't always be adequate. And if we try to give you know, medical uh, remedies for spiritual problems, uh, they will you know, barely touch it. Now, I think, Steve, yeah, I think the danger as well is when you also have Christian psychologists or Christians that um, in the medical field that also diagnose um, it such a mistakenly. Yeah, well, the problem, the problem is a psychologist... Uh, a Christian psychologist or a secular psychologist, if they've got some kind of a degree in psychology or, or a psychiatrist who's a medical doctor who also has some kind of training in uh, you know, people's mental issues, um, if, that, if, if they think they know everything about you know, human problems, they're wrong. And most of them who have, uh, virtually everybody who's been trained in universities as a psychologist, has been trained in theories that were invented by atheists. 
I mean, frankly, Sigmund Freud was an atheist. Carl Jung was not an atheist. He was an occultist. He had a spirit guide. Uh, you know, people like Carl Rogers and, and uh, Maslow and so forth, they were humanists. They weren't, uh, they weren't believers in the Bible. So, so their theories about human behavior and human problems totally lacked any insight into the spiritual nature of man. Um, so, you know, if, I'm, if I want to become a Christian psychologist, I'm going to have to study under professors who studied under professors who studied under professors who studied these guys. And so even though a man can be a Christian and a psychologist, uh, his psychology in most cases is not going to come from the Bible because the Bible isn't a psychological book. It's a book about our spiritual life. Listen, I need to move along. I do appreciate your call always. We're not done. We have another half hour ahead, so don't go away. We just want to let you know that the narrow path is listener supported. It's not commercially supported. We don't have commercials, don't have sponsors, don't have anything that we sell. We don't sell anything at our website or over the air. We just let you know. We pay bills to be on the air. And if you'd like to help us do that, you can write to us at The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. That's The Narrow Path, P.O. Box 1730, Temecula, California, 92593. Or you can donate from the website where everything is free. That's thenarrowpath.com. I'll be right back. Tell your family, tell your friends, tell everyone you know about the Bible radio show that has nothing to sell you but everything to give you. And that's The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. When today's radio show is over, go to your social media and send a link to thenarrowpath.com where everyone can find free topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and archives of all The Narrow Path radio shows. And tell them to listen live right here on the radio. Thank you for sharing listener-supported The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Welcome back to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we are live for another half hour taking your calls. If you have questions about the Bible or the Christian faith, we would be glad to talk to you here. Uh, The lines are full at the moment, but they do open up in the course of the half hour. So if you have a number ready and dial at just the right time, and I can't tell you what that time will be, you have to take your chances, uh, you may get in. And and people do throughout the the hour of our broadcast. Uh, New callers get through uh, even when the lines are full at the beginning. The number to call is 844-484-5737. And our next caller today is Franklin, uh, Franken, it says, maybe maybe misspelled, maybe Franklin, or Franken, at, in North Texas. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Good afternoon, Steve. It's Frank. Frank. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, listen. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's Frank in. Okay, I got it. Frank in North Texas. Okay, I didn't okay. get it. I answered most things. Listen, uh, well put on the physical and uh, uh, spiritual difference. I mean, I... That's uh, I, uh, that's good stuff. Uh, uh, real quick, uh, I'm a little bit hung up on um, Exodus chapter three, verse twenty, just on on a uh, one word, and uh, I'll read it real quick. It says, uh, Exodus three, verse twenty. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in its midst, and after that, he will let you go. Um, all my wonders. All my wonders, I, you know. Does that mean something? Wonders? Does that mean something different than what we're used to? Um, uh, yeah, wonders is, is a good thing. I mean, I, I'm sure he's, they're talking about the plagues, correct? Yes, the ten plagues. Uh huh. Right, right. And how? Well, I mean, how do we call that wonders? I mean, it's. Uh, well, there's a number of oh. number of a number of words that the Bible uses for miracles. And there are different mm-hmm. kinds of miracles. Uh, it's not uncommon to read about signs and wonders. Um, a sign is a miracle that actually uh, communicates something, actually uh, stands for something. It, it, for example, Jesus' uh, miracles that are in John, John's gospel refers to them as signs. Uh, repeatedly, he calls them signs. And uh, every miracle that John records, and there's not very many in the gospel of John, only about seven, Every one of them corresponds to some message 
like uh, Jesus is the light of the world, and he opened the eyes of the blind. Jesus is the bread of life, and he fed the multitudes. Uh, Jesus is the, the true vine, and he turns water into wine. Um, you know, he's the resurrection of the life, and he, ends up, and he raises a man from the dead. These are instances where the, the miracles of Jesus are not just uh, miracles for the sake of uh, doing a miracle, but they, they carry information, and they're called signs, like signs, signs do carry information. Now, wonders simply refers to a miracle that is astonishing, something that's awesome. an ast- astonishment, awesome, uh, wonders. Yeah, so it's not, it, it, they can be good or bad, but in the case of the plagues brought on Egypt, they certainly were astonishing miracles, so they qualify as wonders. And if, the, if, you, if, if we think of them as, oh, but those are negative wonders. Well, they're negative to the Egyptians. They were good for the Israelites. I mean, every time the Israelites saw one of those wonders occur, they knew they were closer to being delivered uh, from their bondage. So uh, a wonder is not in itself a positive or negative experience for people. Uh, it may be a positive experience for some and negative for others, as when the cloud was, uh, the pillar was leading Israel through the w- uh, wilderness and the I- Egyptians were pursuing them. The same cloud was darkness for the Egyptians, which present, prevented them from traveling, and it was fire and light for the Israelites so they could keep traveling all night and increasing the distance between good, them and their good pursuers. For one, good for one and bad for the other. And, right. Uh, I, I, you know, um, we talked about this. It was at Bible study the other night, Wednesday night, and um, I know sometimes when you're reading something, there's a almost a misinterpretation of a word, uh-huh. and um, I, I, it, nothing's perfect, I understand that, uh, other than God, but um, uh, I, I just didn't want to stumble over that, and I, I was, uh, um, okay. I'm, yeah, just just uh, when you find the word wonders, when you find the word wonders in the Bible, uh, it doesn't mean it's wonderful in the sense that we would say that. We use the word wonderful to mean, you know, Great that's, and excellent. That's where, you know. that's where I go. <laughs> yeah, I but the Bible, that, but the, go ahead. but the Bible does use the word wonderful, you know. Uh, but it it means full of wonder. It doesn't mean, you know, great or necessarily positive. I mean, God can work wonderful judgments too. Uh, it, but it means that they they elicit wonder or awe, is is what the word wonder means in the in the Bible. Okay, I'm good with that. Hey, I'll let you go. I know you got a lot of people waiting. God bless yeah, you. I do. Uh, Thank you, Frank. Yourself. Thank right. you, Frank. Bye-bye. God bless. Bye now. Okay, uh, Mike in Denver, Colorado. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Thank you so much for taking my call, Steve. And first of all, I did just want to offer my condolences um, on the passing of your father. Um, you know, your show means so much to me as a younger person. I'm 24 years old, and I just uh, thank you so much for being here for everyone. And it means a lot. So just thank you. Um, sure. I, I had a, so I had a kind of a comment and a question today. So, Steve, you know, hearing you talk about your parents, that made me think of a question today. So, so many times our our religious ideologies are kind of shaped as children, and our parents obviously have a big role in that. And I know personally, um, religion played a big part in my life growing up uh, due to my parents being put in a Christian school and being introduced to the Bible. Um, and I wanted. <clears throat> I wanted to ask you, um, when you were growing up, um, you know, how did your parents help you to form your faith in God, and how did you kind of come to realize uh, that religion and Christianity was kind of the path you wanted to take in life? Uh, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, well, my parents, uh, first of all, uh, they spoke about uh, you know Christ and the Bible and God, but but more than they did that. Uh, they exhibited Christian life. Uh, my, my parents were loving, happy, uh, righteous living people, uh, regular in church, but uh, whether they'd been regular in church or not, I think they would have still been the same kind of people. They, they didn't depend on church going for their Christianity, but, but they did raise us in church. And I have to say, uh, some good things were planted in my life through going to church and Sunday school. Uh, I will say I don't remember one thing the pastor said, uh, not because I was too young, but because he was, he was pretty boring. Uh, but uh, some of my Sunday school teachers said things that, that I remembered that were po- very positive. But I remember throughout my upbringing that my dad and mom would simply make very brief references, very cogent references to things that Jesus said um, 
uh, in, in, co- in connection with things in real life. For example, uh, it may be, uh, many people will remember this who are my age. Uh, there used to be a TV show I'd watch uh, called The Monkees, which was about a, 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 a band that was very Beatlesque, mm-hmm. uh, but it was a comedy show. And, and, uh, and they'd feature some of their songs. And one of their songs was Only Shades of Gray. And I remember there was a line in it, today there's no wrong or right, today there's no black and white, there's only shades of gray. And I was not, I mean, I was a pretty young kid when I was watching it. It, it didn't strike me as having spiritual uh, ramifications at all. And my mom was working in the kitchen and I was watching it. So she heard that. She said, I wonder what your, wonder what your friend Billy Graham would say about that. Now, I, I wasn't friends with Billy Graham, but I was a huge admirer <laughs> of Billy Graham from my youth. And I remember, I remember thinking, well, I, it never occurred to me that what I was listening to had any spiritual ramifications, but it got me thinking that, yeah, wait, there's not just shades of gray. There are black and white. I remember there was a time when I was about seven years old that uh, my dad and I were leaving uh, a store, and he'd been reading a magazine. I was reading a comic book uh, as we were waiting for my mom to come through the check line, and when she came through and said, let's go, my dad uh, put the magazine back on the rack, and I, I tossed the comic book down. Um, you know, just on, and, and it was messy. And my dad said, uh, is that how you found that there? And I says, no. And he said, well, you remember what Jesus said about uh, what you want people to do to you, you should do to others. And he mm-hmm. said, uh, if you owned this store and you had an orderly rack of magazines, would you like it very much if people came in and, and messed it up like that? And I, you know, he wasn't scolding me. It wasn't, it wasn't even sharp. It was just instructional. It's just like reminding me. And, and it made a profound impression. Here I am, 67 years old. I still remember the conversation. I can still picture the store. Um, and it, it had a profound impression on me. So, I mean, I think what my parents did right was they lived their faith and they applied it in like everyday secular situations. They'd remind us of what Jesus said and so forth. Now, my dad was not a preacher. He worked for Edison Company. He had a huge library, uh, such as a preacher would have, of Christian books, which I was raised having access to. My dad didn't really have extremely sophisticated knowledge of the Bible, but he was a sincere believer. He, he'd been a Christian well, since his childhood, and, and he knew the Bible probably better than the average person. But, but there were times I'd ask him Bible questions, and he wouldn't know the answer. He'd tell me which, which of his books I could go and find it in, and he'd let me go look it up. And and that was, uh, I grew up with that happening, you know. And so I just remember a lot of times, my both my parents uh, would just, I mean, they were the kind of people that everybody loved, everyone admired, everyone found enjoyable because they were so sweet and happy and uh, and good, just good people. And uh, and they also, they believed the Bible, and in so far as they knew it, they they passed it on to us. And not just in, you know, I don't remember, we didn't really have family devotions because we got up at, at different times in the morning. So we didn't get together every morning and have family devotions. My dad would go off to work and we'd go off to school and so forth. But even though we didn't have a systematic uh, religious training in our home like that, it was like the Bible and, and Jesus and God, they just permeated everything in our home everything in life. Mm-hmm. And, and my siblings, I have a, a younger brother and an older sister. Uh, all of us came to the Lord in our youth. Uh, and uh, as far as me deciding to become a Christian, I never even remembered that I was making a decision. I did go forward at some altar calls. Uh, uh, one when I was four years old, my mom told me about it. I don't remember it. I remember going forward at, at 10 years old at a Billy Graham crusade. But but I didn't think I was becoming a Christian. I just went forward because he offered some booklets and stuff, and I and I did want to, I did want to you know affirm my belief. Uh, but I th- I think I was a Christian before that. Um, I just don't remember ever choosing to become a believer. I just remember I always believed in God. I was I mean my parents raised me in, in an environment that you know God was real, God was His word was important, and. Uh, I, I mean, all my siblings are good, good Christians, following the Lord, they're serving the Lord. Uh, we were all Christian musicians, all of us kids, and, uh, and my, my siblings play in Christian worship bands now, um, still, although they're old like me. Uh, but <laughs> I, I, per, perhaps a little more than them, I, just, I was kind of obsessed with knowing the Bible. Not, not that they didn't read, they, mm. they read and studied the Bible too. 
but I didn't want to do anything else after a while. I just wanted to know the Bible, and so I did read it a lot. And uh, I think part of that is not really directly related to what my parents did, but just partly due to what God was going to call me to be. I had that kind of in me and uh, to be a teacher. Uh, so I think that had some, uh, that played a considerable role. But I can't think of anything my parents did wrong. Now, when I was younger, homeschooling my kids, I would have said my parents were mistaken to send me to public school. But of course, they had never heard of homeschooling. And when I was a kid, no one was doing that. So they, it was not even a, a consideration. But when I was homeschooling my kids, um, you know, I thought, well, my parents, you know, were wrong to send me to public school. I don't want to make that mistake. But then their kids turned out better than my kids did, honestly. Wow. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, God covered for them, you know, because they're good. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, that's, that's as long an answer I can give you right now because there's so many people waiting. Okay. Thank you so much, Steve. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Mike. God bless you. Um, oh, by the way, and in, 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 uh, just one further point, he was asked what my parents did right uh, so that you know, in raising us kids to follow Jesus. Maybe the thing they most did right was to be loving to each other. Um, I think when kids are growing up and their parents are Christians and they can tell their parents are devoted to each other, uh, and they're not just tolerating each other. Uh, I think that that makes a very positive impression uh, on on children. It, it, I'm sure it did on us. So we weren't even aware it was making that impression. It was just it was just life as we knew it. But looking back, I think that was very probably uh, the best thing they gave us. Uh, Ted in Denver, Colorado. Another Denver, Colorado. Hello. Hey, Steve. <clears throat> I was just wondering what your thoughts were. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, regarding. Uh, like, uh, you know, euthanasia for someone that, you know, maybe uh, already already down that path, but, you know, they, they don't want to, you know, die the agonizing death. Well, uh, nobody wants to die an agonizing death or live an agonizing life. Uh, sometimes the will of God includes agonization, <laughs> agony. Uh, you know, I mean, Jesus agonized in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, and he could have, you know, he actually asked God, if possible, to take the cup from him. He was so much in agony. And certainly uh, Job was in agony in his trials. And I'm pretty sure Joseph uh, in, in Egypt, uh, in, in prison and so forth, spent some agonizing times. And, and frankly, I have had some agonizing periods in my life, and I think most people have. Um, now, of course, the agony of a very painful illness at the end of life is particularly uh, difficult. Uh, although when it comes to you know, physical pain from cancer and things like that, a lot of that can be helped with medications now. But um, I don't, I, 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 my view is that we should just leave the matter of our death in the hands of God. Now that doesn't mean that if someone's lost all, you know, uh, functions, and everything about their life is being kept going by machines. So, I mean, that if you turn off the machine, they'd stop breathing or their heart would stop. Uh, I, I, I think that that's not, to me, that's, it's not euthanasia to turn off the machine. So it's just letting God have his way. <laughs> it's, a, it's not stopping God from doing what would naturally happen. Because I believe that God does have a time for each of his children to pass. And, uh, and for us to try to prolong it by extreme and unnatural measures, uh, I think is not always a good idea. But if somebody is just in pain and they're dying, um, I, would, I would much sooner suggest that maybe medical science can comfort them in that stage, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't hasten their death. Partly because I don't know that we have any permission to do that in Scripture. Uh, murder in the Bible is the taking of a human life that's an innocent life and which has not done anything uh, criminally worthy of death. And certainly a person dying in agony cannot be seen as someone who's a criminal worthy of death. They might prefer death, but uh, I understand just all those things to be in God's hands. Uh, if you want you know, scripture for it, there's no scripture about it, uh, ex except that there's at least uh, one person, uh, well, there's three people actually in the Bible, who did end their own lives. Uh, one was... Uh, 
Ahithophel, who had become a traitor against David, and when David was going to come back to power, he hanged himself because he didn't want to face the shame and the consequences of having been a traitor. Uh, Judas Iscariot, likewise, hanged himself. And uh, then there's, of course, King Saul, who was also a rebel against God. Every, everybody who killed himself in the Bible was a rebel against God. But uh, King Saul in particular would be the case of euthanasia of the three because he was wounded and, uh, and the Philistines were coming to get him. And uh, since he was the king and he was their enemy, he figured they would torture him and abuse him and so forth and not let him die quickly. And he didn't want to face that, so he fell on his own sword. Uh, now, he asked his armor bearer to kill him, but his armor bearer wouldn't do it. Apparently, he didn't think that was a moral thing to do, but Saul had long since given up his moral standards, and he just killed himself. So that would be a case of euthanasia more than the other biblical instances, but it doesn't seem like the Bible, you know, favors it. And, uh, you know, if Job had killed himself because he was, uh, had lost his children, he'd lost his, all his wealth, he, now he's in, in terrible sickness, uh, in pain, if he just said, well, I'm just going to put myself out of my misery, uh, well, that would have really thwarted God's will for his life and for ours because of the benefit of Job's story for us. So I, I just, I don't feel that we have permission for euthanasia. I believe it's an, another form of murder, although it is, of course, uh, well-intentioned murder, which is somewhat different than most murder. But well-intentioned murder doesn't, in my opinion, isn't, isn't better, you know, than letting things be and letting God You think those people go to hell that, that do it? Oh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, I think that um, I think people do wrong things blindly, ignorantly, and so forth. And even though they are sins, uh, the level of their culpability might be might be diminished by you know the, the level of their understanding. But uh, I, I never determine who's going to heaven and hell uh, because God's the one who's the ultimate judge of that. But uh, I I believe there are probably people who've had a part in euthanasia who who nonetheless will be in heaven but i think when they are they'll regret having done it that'd be my thought i don't want to live with any regrets for eternity (laughs) it's an interesting thought about god's will you know people people will say it's not god's will and i understand that but at the same time i wonder you know was it god's will if you were going to die anyways but you went to the doctor and you got on a bunch of different drugs to save your life I mean, was that God's will? At what point are we continually circumnavigating God's will yeah. anyways? I by, think the attempt, you know. the attempt to stay alive uh, by, uh, you know, by n- not very radical or invasive means is, is reasonable. I mean, for example, if you're dying of starvation and food becomes available, I don't think there's anything wrong with eating food. Or if you're dying of thirst and water becomes available, I think, I think to do what will prolong your life— uh, naturally, uh, is of course quite reasonable and a good stewardship of your body. Now, when it comes to medicines that aren't exactly natural, but have become available and which do not involve any moral compromise in taking them, then I, I, I'm not against it. I'm not even against uh, necessarily painkillers. Uh, though, uh, I mean, if I have surgery, I want painkillers. But of course, for many thousands of years, people had to have surgery or, or die without painkillers. I think it's a blessing. I think God's blessed us to have anesthesia, but I think there's a downside too. And so we have to just kind of make a, a decision. The downside is that everybody dies the same now on anesthesia. Uh, whereas in the old days, like Wesley, John Wesley said, our people die well. He thought it was a great testimony for Christ that people uh, who are Christians died with uh, more joy and, and so forth than non-Christians. And, and there's books that have cataloged a lot of cases like that. But, but if everyone's on anesthesia or kind of drugged out uh, in their last moments, no one can tell if they're dying well or not. I mean, it's, it, it may be that anesthesia has robbed the church of one of its greatest testimonies of previous ages. But still, I don't know that it's, I mean, there's nothing in the Bible forbidding it. Uh, the Good Samaritan uh, you know, treated uh, the man that he found wounded and bleeding uh, with the medicine of his time, pouring oil and, and, uh, and wine into his wounds, which is the best he could do, uh, that wasn't wrong. That's part of loving him. So I'm, 
there's there's a, a line, you know, uh, where you'd say, okay, if we pull the plug here, he's going to die. Well, okay, if he's going to die, that means he's not really living naturally. Uh, he's he's a machine is keeping his functions going. But but if a person's functions are still going on and they're just in a lot of pain, as much as I sympathize with them, I truly do. I would not recommend taking any measures to commit suicide. I don't think suicide. Do you think ever, they should just take the medications and, and deal with it? Like uh, if someone's in chronic pain. At the least, just... at the least, yeah, at the least. So, hey, I need to give someone else a chance okay. here. I, I appreciate your call. Uh, let's try to talk to another caller before we're out of time. Brandon from Edmonds, Washington. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi. I was reading through Deuteronomy recently, and in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 39, Moses has been recapping the escapades of Israel's military, and he's supposed to encourage Joshua, who will take the land. And then it says that also the little children, the little ones and the children who don't know good from evil, and that's why they'll they'll move into the promised land. And then in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 34, talking about their conquest, I think, of Canaanites. Uh, it says that we totally destroyed their cities, yes, including their women and their children. And I just thought it was curious that God had recognized that the little children who didn't know good from evil, therefore they were, like, justified, I guess, to go into the promised land, but the uh-huh. you know, there was no sparing of the Canaanite children. Yeah, well, God definitely was doing special things with Israel that he didn't do with anyone else, including giving them a land. And, uh, he, you know, if God had wiped out all the adults and women and children of Israel, uh, there'd be no, no Israel. The point of the Canaanite uh, conquest is God wanted there to be no Canaanites left. He wanted them all to be gone. Mm-hmm. Now, if a person is a baby or a young child and doesn't know good and evil, well, God certainly knows, but I, th- I think that the Bible indicates that God takes into consideration ignorance when it comes to the severity of his judgments. And if a person dies truly innocent, and again, only God knows how innocent anyone is when they die, but uh, truly they don't know anything, they haven't done anything wrong that they know of, a baby would certainly be in that position. In my opinion, anyone who dies innocent, and by the way, people do, Christians, very good Christians die, uh, and they're innocent before God, but dying is something that happens to everybody. But what's important is not who dies, but what happens after they die. Um, You know, if a person dies innocent or reconciled with God, there's no possibility that God would condemn him because God doesn't condemn the innocent. So, uh, you know, we we sometimes worry about these children and we think, well, you know, they didn't do anything wrong. True. And God knows very well what they may or may not have done wrong. God knows very well how innocent they may be. And I believe you. I, I believe that children are innocent when they're very young. I don't know at what point any given child reaches a state of accountability where, you know, where suddenly he's no longer innocent for his crimes and his sins. But uh, one thing we know is God's judgment is always just. That doesn't mean that ever that life is always fair. God's justice is usually settled at the great white throne judgment. And so many injustices are uh, are part of this life. War, not only the Canaanite wars, but all wars. They bring about uh, injustices. Uh, when children are uh, killed by child abuse by their parents, that's an injustice. But there will be ultimate justice because the Bible says so. God's going to sit on his throne and judge everyone righteously, and everyone will get exactly what he knows they deserve. So we don't have to worry about babies or old men or young men or anyone who die. Uh, the fact that they're going to die is a given. What's going to happen to them after they die is the only thing that really is a concern. And uh, Christians and babies, I think, don't have anything to worry about in that respect. You've been listening to The Narrow Path. My name is Steve Gregg, and we are live Monday through Friday. We're listener-supported. If you'd like to help us stay on the air, go to our website. All the resources there are free, but you can donate there if you want to. It's thenarrowpath.com. Have a good weekend. Let's talk again Monday.